Shabbat Shalom, friends. We're reading on this Shabbat Parshat Amor, which describes each one of our holidays, these days of sacred coming together from Passover to Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to Sukkot. These are days of celebration and sacred convocation in the language of the Torah, bringing us into alignment with the Holy One, with the earth and with the community Israel. And the Omer, the period between Passover and Shavuot, which we're in right now, is described in this Parsha as a time of incredible joy. Offerings are brought from the harvest and they're waved before God as a symbol of prosperity and abundance. It's a great celebration. But over the course of time, this period becomes associated not with joy and celebration, but with mourning. A mourning that's explicitly connected in the Shulchan Aruch to a terrible tragedy that occurred in the time of Rabbi Akiva about 2000 years ago. It's customary, we learn, to live in a state of quasi mourning for the first 33 days of the Omer from the second night of Passover until yesterday, culminating in Lag Be'omer, because in the language of the Shulchan Aruch, the students of Rabbi Akiva died during that period. From that day forward, from Lag Be'omer forward, the grieving is lifted because according to our tradition, that's when the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying. So Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 disciples, 12 thousand pairs of chavruta, a massive following and stretched out across a very significant geographical area. And then within a very condensed period of time, we are taught that they all died, all of them. I want to ask you to imagine for a moment the scale of that loss. And as you do, Remember that this is a tragedy on top of a tragedy. The Jewish community was still reeling from the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, from the temple in Jerusalem, from the devastating loss of life and the destruction of the, of the whole city of Jerusalem and our most sacred spaces. The people were still living under oppressive Roman rule. And then this tragedy occurred so sudden and so inexplicable, 24,000 students of Torah gone in an instant. The impact on the community was devastating, and not only on Rabbi Akiva, but on the whole world. Ha'olam shamem, it says in the Talmud, the whole world was made desolate in their absence. And so a time that was historically and biblically mandated to be a time of joy and celebration became a time of grieving. This maps so painfully and so chillingly onto the situation that unfolded this week. When Lag Be'omer, which was celebrated all around the world and especially met with a, with a massive celebration in Meron in Northern Israel, which was intended to be the, this peak moment of joy became instead a time of absolute devastation. I'm sure you've all seen and read and heard by now, but more than 100,000 Jews went to celebrate at the tomb of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And in an unthinkable tragedy, while they were passing through a narrow passageway deep in the night, 45 people were trampled to death and many, many more severely injured including a number of children. And I just learned today two pairs of brothers. The first thing I thought when I heard this on Thursday evening was had it been one death, had it been one person that we learned of whose breath was swept out of his lungs while he was trying to celebrate Lag Omer, one person whose family in Jerusalem was desperately trying to reach him to see if he was okay, that itself would have been a devastation to even begin to imagine that this tragedy took down 45 people is an unthinkable loss. One survivor described it like an erupting volcano of bodies, lives overturned, children left without parents, parents who now have to bury their children, a whole nation and a people plunged into deep, deep grief in the last 48 hours. 
my friend, Rev. Claudia Kreiman, really poignantly wrote that this tragedy upends the formula that's offered in Megillat Esther, the trajectory of Jewish life, which we talk about all the time. Meyagon lesimcha, meevel leyom tov, from from devastation to joy, from grieving to celebration. But now, in an instant, it shifted course, and we moved misimcha liyagon from joy into grief, meyom tov leevel, from celebration into sadness. So, what are we left to do but grieve? We sing together. We recite to Hillim psalms. In a few moments, we'll sing Achenu, one of the most haunting and powerful songs I know that speaks to the incredible depth of connection that we feel to the rest of our family, whether they're near or far. We say mourners Kaddish. However connected or disconnected you might personally feel from the Haredi community here or in Israel, this is part of our family. This is a limb. This is a part of our body. The Midrash teaches in Vayikra Rabbah that even if only one of Israel's in pain, every one of us feels it. From that really great sadness, I know that we will find consolation. The very text in the Talmud in Yevamot that speaks of the devastation of Rabbi Akiva's students also speaks of their eventual healing. It says the world was desolate of Torah until Rabbi Akiva came to our rabbis in the south and taught his Torah to them. He, he developed a second group of disciples there, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua. And these are the ones who go on to carry his words into the next generation. This is a, this is a hopeful message. This is, again, Rav Claudia says this is a, a message of resilience. Rabbi Akiva grieved, and then after some time passed, he found another community of learning. He found new students who were able to receive his Torah and carry it to the next generation. But there is also another lesson for us to learn in this journey of grief and recovery. There are a variety of explanations that are offered for the tragic deaths of the students of Rabbi Akiva, from pandemic to shemada to persecution. This explanation is offered by Rav Shrira Gaon and Rambam and others who say that this devastating loss of 24,000 students was due to Rome putting down the Bar Kokhba uprising. And other explanations are offered as well. But the Talmud is very explicit about what the cause of this tragedy was, echoing the rabbinic assertion that we talked about on Rosh Hashanah this year from Yoma that the temple itself was destroyed because of senseless hatred, because of our senseless hatred, not the Roman legions. Here too, they write, they died because they didn't treat each other with respect. That is so hard for us to read. It's so hard to hear. It's so fresh. It's an incomprehensible loss, loss in the context of loss. And yet the Talmud calls us to consider that these deaths were not just tragic, that they were a sign of a greater societal failure. We have to pay attention to that call. We have to do chashbon hanefesh, soul searching, today too, not only in Rabbi Akiva's time. This is not to blame the victims of a terrible tragedy for their own suffering, God forbid. But we have to hear our tradition's insistence on introspection in the face of tragedy, we ignore the root causes again and again at our own peril. The message here is really clear. In our grief through our tears, we also must reflect. We have to ask the hard questions. When a terrible tragedy like this occurs, who is responsible? And what must we do to make sure such a thing does not happen again? Within a few hours after the tragedy on Thursday night, we learned that for more than a decade, there were urgent reports that were issued by, from the city comptroller warning us that this Meron site was not equipped to handle the number of people who were drawn there year after year to celebrate Lagba Omer. They feared some potential catastrophe. There were multiple official requests made to close this site altogether in order to save lives. This year, we know that officials expressed concern about COVID exposure and then failed to place any limit on the crowd size. 
We know that officials expressed concern that there were insufficient safety protocols in place to prevent catastrophic loss of life. And they even pointed specifically to the narrow passage where this tragedy occurred as a place of potential danger. Knowing that, knowing all of that, anyone who cares about Israel and the Jewish people has to ask in what ways have we again failed to protect the human beings who are at the heart of our great project? What shortcuts have we been willing to take? What risks have we allowed as a community, whether out of fear or for political expediency, what messages have we ignored? What tensions have we allowed to simmer and ultimately to dictate public policy? Where did the state bow to the desires of the people rather than fight to protect the people? Where's the accountability? What could, what should have been done differently so that these lives could have been saved? Asking these questions in the days ahead does not betray the dead, it honors them because it's the only way to avert future disasters in the face of devastating communal loss our tradition points us toward relentless self-scrutiny. Here's what happened to Rabbi Akiva when he engaged in honest self-reflection, even in the face of so much loss. His most enduring teaching is the argument that you shall love your neighbor as yourself from Leviticus, that this is the very essence of Torah. And yet his own students fail to treat one another with love and respect. He realizes this. It must have been so painful for him to recognize. He probably saw it as a personal failure, compounding his grief with guilt. But instead of running from it, Rabbi Akiva confronts it. And when he does rebuild, he makes sure that his new students don't miss his core message. In contrast to the earlier students, one of his new students, Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua, famously teaches in Pirkei Avot the following, Yihi chavod talmidcha chaviv alecha kishelcha. Let your dignity of your students be as dear to you as your own dignity. Let the dignity of your colleagues be like that that you show your own teacher. Let the dignity of your teacher be like the honor that you show toward heaven. We also need to reflect and ultimately to reconstitute. After every tragedy, that's what we're called to do. I pray that we'll do so with open and tender hearts. For now, at the end of a week of immense tragedy and loss, we pray for consolation for those whose lives have been overturned. And we pray that the memories of those who perished in this tragedy will forever be a blessing.